slide show here. I'm having one of those moments where the, the Zoom commands are covering up my, uh, my PowerPoint commands. We'll just leave it like this for a second. So Blunt Mansion is the birthplace of Tennessee. It's a circa 1792 house museum in downtown Knoxville. It was built for William Blunt in 1792. He was uh, kind of a big deal in North Carolina, his native state. He was uh, basically an aristocrat, a member of the business elite, uh, a landowner, and had invested heavily in lands in what would become Tennessee. Uh, his contrib biggest contribution to American history was being one of the signers of the U.S. Constitution in Philadelphia in 1787. So he helped to frame the document that uh, founded our government. And for this reason, and because of his significant land holdings, along with his brothers and what would become Tennessee, Blunt was appointed by George Washington in 1790 to govern the Southwest Territory. And if that shape looks familiar to you, it's because it became Tennessee. Uh, North Carolina used to cover everything from the Atlantic Ocean all the way to the Mississippi River, and it was not until Congress uh, was going to tax each state on its landmass to pay for the Revolutionary War debt that North Carolina finally had the incentive to get rid of that land, and they gave everything west of the Appalachians to the federal government, and it became a federal territory that William Blunt governed, and his job, uh, among other things, was to make peace with the Cherokee so that settlers could come here and then take the steps to create a state government and birth Tennessee into statehood. So that happened in 1796. <clears throat> the first Tennessee constitution was signed on this desk, which used to be in David Henley's office. It's now in Blunt Mansion. So this is the statehood desk and it will be 225 years this June 1st uh, that Tennessee has been a state. And we'll be celebrating that at Blunt Mansion as the birthplace of Tennessee. And because of Blunt's role as a constitution signer and territorial governor, this is the only National Historic Landmark in Knoxville. If you visit Blunt Mansion today, uh, and again, we've been in existence for 95 years now, so some things never change, some things do, uh, but stepping inside will be a, a trip back in time and to beautifully preserve uh, late 18th century rooms that are just, you know, surrounded by this the concrete canyon of downtown, but with the gardens that we have, it's just a wonderful place to uh, step back in history and step out of the hustle and bustle of downtown. Uh, the, the pandemic did a number on us, just like it did to all the other museums across the state and across the nation. Uh, we were really thriving at a growing field trip business. We saw more than 1,400 students in person in calendar year 2019. With the pandemic, we needed to find a new way to reach people. So uh, we went into the classroom and this is my son's class at South Knox Elementary. We began a series of weekly virtual visits uh, on February 3rd. So every Wednesday, our educator, Josh, goes into the classroom and he'll be talking about more of these visits in detail later. Uh, as we mentioned on Tuesday, we've done a constitution and quill pen activity where we send the materials into the class and the kids write with quill pens and learn about Blunt's role in founding both the uh, framing the US and the Tennessee constitutions. Uh, and tried their own hand at uh, writing the way people did in the 18th century. We've talked about flags and symbols. We've made butter with heavy cream and mason jars and even learned about uh, early Tennessee newspapers and created our own newspaper articles. And then most recently, we practiced Cherokee handicrafts with bees. So uh, Josh will be telling you more about that. Uh, we're most excited though that thanks to you and those of you who responded to our, uh, our offer of this PD, we reached out to teachers in West and Middle Tennessee where we haven't worked before and began offering these virtual classrooms there as well, virtual classroom visits. So we were in this Knight's fourth grade class in Murray County uh, in Middle Tennessee a few days ago doing quill pens and constitutions. And then we were in this Pickens fourth grade class uh, in Madison County talking about flags and symbols. And we also are offering this opportunity to anybody tonight who wants it. And I'm gonna put this in the chat now and I will also be emailing this to you later. So we needed to find ways to advance our story, not just take it in new places, but share new stories in new ways. So one of the things that we're most proud of is that we got a grant and uh, from a donor in town and created a new website. Our website dated to uh, 2010. So it was almost a museum artifact itself. And uh, we've been able to put things on there that I think will matter to you as teachers. So this is our new website. And uh, beyond the obvious aesthetic, the fact that it highlights our gardens and uh, takes you inside, I really like the, the way that the 
earth the sepia tones kind of look like an old document and blend with the colors inside. But what's exciting for educators is the materials that have been added to our education page and our history page. I'm going to start with the history. If you click on family members, <clears throat> this puts together all of our research on every blunt family member. So there's a, a paragraph for each person and conjectural silhouettes that a graphic designer created because we only have images of William. We don't know what anybody else in the family looked like. So there's, uh, and some of these are links to uh, where you can go deeper and read more about them, like click here for more information about William Blunt. And this takes you to uh, kind of a, a rap sheet that we've created for William Blunt. But we've also added a page on the enslaved people who were in bondage to the Blunt family. And this is Lisa's research that she'll be talking about in just a few minutes. And as you scroll down, you learn about Hagar and Venus and Jack and Cupid and the people who actually built Blunt Mansion, ran Blunt Mansion, and made East Tennessee possible in its earliest days. So that's uh, one of the ways that we are trying to bring voice to the voiceless and give you resources that you can use in your class. And if you go to the Education tab and click on Resources, uh, we've, we're adding more things all the time. At first, you'll see a couple of PDF links, the Tennessee standards that are addressed by Blunt Mansion for all the grade levels that are applicable and also a lesson plan that one of our board members who is a social studies educator and curriculum uh, supervisor here in Knox County has created for us. And then there are videos, a 20 minute guided video tour of Blunt Mansion, some artifact videos, a video of one of our educators cooking in our kitchen. We add more all the time. And there's one other place you should check. If you go to about and scroll down to constitution connection, because William Blunt was a signer of the US constitution, uh, we've added, we've kind of compiled resources about how you can teach the Constitution in the classroom. So we've got a video about Blunt's role in framing our government and uh, also links to the National Constitution Center, We the Civics Kids, Library of Congress, and the Annenberg Classroom. All four of these are places where you can go for lesson plans, uh, printable PDFs, all kinds of things that you can use at various grade levels in your classroom. So. With that, I'll stop my share and I'm going to hand it over to Josh now, who will hopefully have a little more luck with his Zoom than I did. And uh, Josh will tell us about two more of the virtual classroom visits that we offer at Blunt Mansion and how we've used them in classrooms so far. All right. Let me share my screen here. Hopefully I don't have the same problems. Um, so my, hello, my name is Joshua Renner. Uh, I am the education coordinator here at Blunt Mansion, and I will be discussing several of our recent uh, virtual classroom visits and how they might benefit you and your class. Uh, all of our virtual classes consist of interactive PowerPoints made by myself, uh, and they all end with a hands-on activity provided by Blunt Mansion in regards to the topic we discuss. So the first one I'll talk about, uh, keeping in line with Blunt Mansion being primarily interpreted as an 18th century historic site, we have a class available on 18th century food and cooking. Uh, here, we talk about how people on the frontier obtained food, either through hunting or fishing or farming. Then we discuss what kinds of foods they would prepare and who would prepare them. William Blunt was a slave owner, and at Blunt Mansion, we strive to include the enslaved story as a main piece of our narrative. We know that Blunt had an enslaved family of four who would have slept in a loft above the kitchen. Cupid, the man, was the primary architect and engineer on the property and, and abroad. His partner, Sal, and their two daughters, Nan and Isabella, would have had the responsibility of completing all of the cooking and cleaning every day, working out of Blunt Mansion's small kitchen building that you see in the picture down there below. We are very lucky today that uh, this kitchen is totally safe to cook in, um, and we actually do use it from time to time. So anyone that was with us Tuesday night might remember Karma King speaking, um, she cooked her three sisters recipe from that very kitchen. Our activity for this class consists of teaching the students how to make their own butter. Uh, believe it or not, it is incredibly easy. Um, and like all of our classes, we will supply you with the materials. To make butter on a small scale, uh, all you have to do is pour a little mason jar half full with heavy whipping cream and then shake the jar really hard for about 10, 15 minutes. As it's being shook, you will actually begin to hear the cream separating. And once it is shaken properly, you will be left with a ball of butter and buttermilk. 
Um, this activity was a huge hit and made the local news. You can watch the uh, clip of right here. Within minutes of walking into Susan Parker's third grade class at South Knoxville Elementary, Chloe Klaus told me, I love butter. Something many of us relate to. The virtual field trip led by the Blood Mansion taught students about natural resources and food from the 18th century. Making butter was something new for Chloe. It's so cool. All it takes is a mason jar. I'm really excited to shake it up more because it's not really shook up. Heavy cream and a lot of strength and patience. We got to do like a big activity that not many people do in their everyday life. One of the toughest parts for Archer Rodacker. Waiting for the butter to be done. Playing music to help pass the time. Yeah. Finding unique ways to make the butter. My arms are tired. Took about 15 minutes of shaking and dancing. And then... Holy moly! They did it. It's making me feel really good because I've never did butter like that before. It's a little more bland than the stuff at the store. It was good. It's not actually so bad. It's like water. In South Knoxville, Ashley Boley, WVLT News. So that was a very successful class, as I'm sure you can tell. <clears throat> Another class we offer revolves around flags and symbolism. Uh, we begin by looking at the United States flag and its many changes over our years as a country. 27 changes to be exact. We pause for a moment on the 15 star flag. That's the flag that we had flying just before Tennessee became a state. And Tennessee actually played a role in changing it there afterwards. This is also the flag that Francis Scott Key saw flying above Fort McHenry after the British bombardment during the War of 1812, uh, prompting him to create the poem, which would later become our national anthem. We also look at Tennessee's flag and its evolution over time, as well as discuss the symbolism behind, behind why it looks like it does. Finally, we like to include something in this presentation that will be personal to you and your students. In the case of Ms. Parker's third grade class uh, there in Knoxville, we talked about the Knoxville city flag and its many symbols, but we don't always have to discuss flags. For Miss Elizabeth Pickens' fourth grade class in Denmark, Tennessee, we looked at a local Civil War battlefield park and talked about how monuments and historical sites can be used as symbols to remind us of our history and values in much the same way that flags can. We also end this class with an activity allowing students to design their very own flag for their classroom, keeping in mind the symbolism we discussed beforehand. Uh, Ms. Pickens is actually with us tonight. Um, Ms. Pickens, is there anything you'd like to say about our presentation? Uh, the kids were really into it. They watched, they paid better attention than they do to me a lot of times. Um, and they really enjoyed the activity at the end. They liked being able to touch the flag, the 15 star flag, that was really um, meaningful to them because we talked, we've talked about the War of 1812 and, and Francis Scott Key writing the national anthem. And so to know that that was the flag that he, I mean, not that flag, but to know that it was a, a representation of the flag he saw flying was really um, meaningful to them. And they really enjoyed making flags at the end. That's excellent. Thank you for sharing. Um, so thank you. Um, my contact information is on the screen here, education coordinator at bluntmansion.org. Uh, feel free to send me an email if you have any questions uh, about what else we can provide for you in your class. And we hope to visit all your classes sometime soon here in the future. Thank you, Josh. And I, I was able to uh, put in the chat uh, while Josh was talking the uh, link for the sign up genius if you want a free blunt mansion virtual visit to your classroom this semester so check that out uh, at this point we're going to turn it over to dr tana nicely the principal at south knoxville elementary uh, who is a veteran educator and has even gardened at the white house with michelle obama are you going to show those pictures again or is that just for tuesday tana oh you're muted Yeah, I've got, I've, yeah, I had to keep the Michelle Obama picture in my slideshow, so. Awesome. <laughs> well, take it away. Okay.
Here we go. So can everybody see my screen okay? Not yet. Okay. Okay. I've got it pulled up. It's not shared yet. Hmm. I'll try again. There we go. Seems like Zoom is a little slow tonight. That's okay. We got this. Okay, here we go. So um, I've noticed several of you all are um, from last night as well. So I, I did change a little bit up, but this is night two. Um, I'm Tana Nicely. I am the principal of South Knoxville Elementary and uh, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, and there's my uh, email address um, if anybody would like to follow or whatever. And so um, just last night, um, I'm, all, I'm all about door prizes as a educator. So when I win a prize, um, comment on this workshop via Twitter, tag uh, myself and Blunt Mansion, and then use the hashtag, which we'll put in the chat, uh, hashtag Blunt Mansion 2021. And we selected a winner last night. I believe she was out of Hamilton County and we'll select one tonight as well and uh, snail mail you a really nice door prize in addition to that cool Visa card that Michael was talking about for doing the survey. Um, I still have a little bit of a theme of the presidential connection, uh, and but if you look back in history, uh, starting with our first president, George Washington, uh, most of the presidents had a um, sort of a side gig of um, having some kind of <clears throat> agriculture in their, uh, you know, toolbox. Uh, and so um, you look at the grounds of Mount Vernon, you look at Monticello and, and uh, even at the White House, um, the presidents had uh, some kind of um, agrobat ground. In fact, some of my favorite co quotes, uh, if you see them even at the Capitol from uh, President um, Thomas Jefferson were about the land and stewardship of the land. So um, with that said, there's the picture. Um, I had a group from a school that I was assistant principal at. We was gardening outside and uh, the working with Monticello, which was it's a uh, home place of Thomas Jefferson, uh, we established the Jeffersonian Heirloom Gardens and which sounds like really fancy, but actually we just uh, traded some seeds with Monticello and planted some heirloom seeds. Uh, and if you've worked with heirloom gardening, you'll know you're not gonna have much of a shelf life with like the beautiful Granger County tomatoes or the beautiful uh, apples from Washington State. Uh, it's very, very quick shelf life and not always a beautiful, symmetrical, uh, gorgeous, uh, you know, uh, fruit or vegetable. So uh, the name of the garden uh, grant caught the eye of uh, Miss Obama's um, cabinet member and anyway make a very long story short uh, I was able to meet Michelle Obama uh, go to the White House twice uh, we plant the gardens and we harvest the garden gardens and the children in Knoxville were celebrities for a little while uh, and uh, when we actually made a pizza out of the garden products and one of our little sweet cherubs from Knoxville was asked uh, what the pizza tastes like and she said it tasted like dirt uh, but CNN reported that it had a uh, earthy tone taste to it so it just tells you the truth in the media um, but you can see that's um, Miss Obama and the uh, girls that are in orange uh, were from my uh, school. So uh, very, very neat couple of times, couple of days uh, for them. These, uh, this is our current garden. Uh, it's not today, but it was last season's garden. And you can see the city of Knoxville in the proximity of Blunt Mansion to our gardens and our school. Um, but I will say Blunt Mansion has an extensive garden, beautiful gardens, uh, lots of our um, 
state homes and museums has some kind of gardening connection. And um, if you want seeds or need seeds, the local co-op is a great resource. And there are lots of great heirloom resources too that you can um, trade seeds. And I have lots of seeds uh, as well to share with you, as well as the Tennessee Farm Bureau that I do some contract work with. Um, we all love ice cream and I have a really uh, simple recipe I'll share in a second for ice cream, but uh, that yummy treat had historical ties as well with uh, President George Washington. Um, President Madison's inauguration had a yummy strawberry ice cream uh, dessert that Dolly um, actually uh, had at the White House and President uh, Thomas Jefferson sort of perfected uh, the ice cream recipe and made it uh, it was actually an elite uh, recipe for the rich and famous, and uh, President Jefferson really sort of got it down to where I can make ice cream now. Uh, but you can make it in the classroom as well. It's called ice cream in a bag, and you use a couple of different size plastic bags, like a gallon size baggie and, a, and maybe a quarter or pint size baggie, and you're going to put the mixture of milk, vanilla, and sugar uh, into the smaller bag and you're going to add rock salt uh, and ice in the larger bag and you're going to put the smaller bag inside the larger bag the, and then you're going to sort of do what you do with making that butter you're going to shake 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 and uh, it's just a really another fun to get your kids moving and then the ice cream is yummy it, it really has a great flavor so I'll uh, share the uh, actual how much sugar and how much vanilla in the uh, in the chat. If you're interested in the ice cream in the bag recipe, it's really easy. Um, seed exchange, uh, as I said, Blunt Mansion offers extensive gardens. Uh, it's important to note that, you know, a lot of us uh, offer those exchange to kickstart your own gardening project. And you can do a lot with a seed uh, as well as predicting and uh, growing the small plants in your classroom to transfer over. Uh, I could do a whole night on that. Um, but I wanted to add tonight a handy measure. And so this is a little lesson plan from the Tennessee Farm Bureau about horses. And back in the day, if you own a horse, you know somebody that owns a horse, horses were measured with your hands. How many hands high was a horse? 15 hands or, or uh, 16 hands high. And so uh, the non-standard uh, measurement of your using your hand instead of a ruler um, or a tape measure is a fun thing for the kids to actually, if you have them just lie on the ground and, and, and the way the kindergarten kids used to trace each other and then have them actually measure them with the hands. And, and, and uh, so that relates back to uh, the actual way that we used to measure horses. Um, and then finally, this is a recipe for pumpkin slime because, uh, you know, what child does not like to talk about pumpkins around Halloween or October? Uh, and, and what child does not like to talk about slime? So this is a kickoff uh, on slime and a kick up and uh, you just use glue, water, baking soda, contact lens cleaner, uh, the insides of a pumpkin or the guts, and you just mix all that mixture together in a, a Rubbermaid container and seal it up and uh, yeah, it's gross, but the kids love it. And it does make a really slimy um, something to, uh, to talk about and for the kids to enjoy. Um, but you can get all of these recipes and all of this information. Uh, if you want to uh, send me uh, a message, I can, get, I can send you a whole uh, sort of a notebook, a soft notebook from the Tennessee Farm Bureau of all kinds of of plans, lesson plans, and, and activities. And I'll just show you one, like the, there's the pumpkin slime uh, at free of charge, doesn't cost anything. Uh, and um, like I said, it's, I think it's important for children to know where their food comes from. And Blunt Mansion does a wonderful job of tying in that historical piece with gardening and with food production. So I, I appreciate what, what uh, Blunt Mansion does for our kids and the butter making, they're still talking about making that butter, uh, Michael and David, that was a huge hit and Josh, and um, they're asking me every day if I can make some more. So thank you for coming out and showing them uh, how cool it was to make butter. The only downside to the butter making uh, activity is that you have to bring something to put it on. 
And mm -hmm. so we've had two classes in South Knox Elementary that have done this. And one teacher had homemade uh, blueberry muffins and the other had to one up it and brought in homemade cornbread. So it became oh, wow. kind of a battle of the classes. <laughs> Thank you, Tana. Does anybody Thanks. have any questions for Tana or Jeff, uh, excuse me, for Tana or Josh before we move into the second part of our program tonight? Feel free to ask them out loud. I guess uh, they can, I guess we'll see if you wave at us if you want to uh, use the reactions on your Zoom too. And Dave, did you want to say anything about making seeds available to teachers as well? Absolutely. Um, I've always got basically a suitcase full of seeds. So um, anybody that's, uh, that's interested, I might be able to, to get you something if there's something specific that you need. Um, usually have a lot of, uh, for classroom situations, it's usually things that germinate very quickly. Peas, beans, um, uh, pumpkins, squash, these kind of things, cucumbers are always a good choice for trying to get something that'll come up fast. And, you know, you get a little bit of science in there as well from them being able to see how the seeds open and change from, you know, beginning to, uh, from the beginning to um, uh, when they're small seedlings. So, so if anybody's looking for something, reach out. We probably come up with something for you. Well, as we pointed out, Blunt Mansion has a colonial revival garden that dates back to the 1940s. And uh, it's certainly not what the Blunts would have known. It's a beautiful garden and it's historic in its own right. But uh, we're really privileged that we've had world-class academic archeology span on our site, uh, primarily in the 1980s and the 1990s under the direction of Dr. Charles Faulkner from the University of Tennessee. And one of his PhD students back in the 90s was Dr. Tim Bauman who is now an anthropology and archeology span professor at UT and also uh, works at the McClung Museum on the UT campus. And so I, I'm really especially excited that we can bring this to you tonight because I think that uh, the very idea of using archeology span in the classroom is really an untapped, exciting new frontier. And I think it's applicable to all grade levels, uh, upper and lower. So without further ado, we'll have Dr. Tim Bauman and Tim, feel free to share your screen. So, I'm assuming you can see it or not. We can see it. Yay, that's half the, half the battle, right? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm so happy to uh, be talking about Blunt Mansion and uh, I'm just truly impressed of what uh, strides you guys have made in the last few years. And, and obviously the uh, thinking on your feet or thinking virtually, uh, I'm trying to make uh, Blunt Mansion its story and its impact, not just in Knoxville, but in the greater state uh, to be very important uh, of what we could be talking about. Um, and, you know, my experience with Blunt Mansion was as a PhD student with working with Charlie Faulkner, um, <clears throat> who's been retired for a number of years now. Um, but, you know, the main thing that uh, what Charlie was doing at that time in the, in the 80s and really the 90s, uh, Blunt Mansion and other historic sites in town was trying to show how archaeology can contribute to what we know about the past, particularly the unwritten or the silence history, the, the parts of history, the everyday life of people, but particularly enslaved African American life, um, and trying to look at the trash, literally the trash that left behind to help tell their story. So I'm going to briefly go through some of this, and uh, hopefully I won't butcher things up for, for Lisa, who will follow along. Uh, as far as the historic records, but um, you know, really, this is a, a, a story that is at many historic uh, house museums in the southeast and the east. That there was people other than the reason why Blunt Mansion was saved, uh, William Blunt, and his, his connection to our history of the state and so forth. But there was a lot more people that lived and died at Blunt Mansion than just William Blunt, and I think that's. Uh, making that connection and making it relevant to everyone's history is very important. And so archaeologists um, really are just no different than detectives that are, uh, are you know, that play in the dirt, you know, it's scientifically play in the dirt, but we play in the dirt. Uh, Archaeology really is a study of past cultures from material remains that they leave behind, so which is mostly old trash, uh, food remains, broken dishes, and so forth. 
job of the archaeologist is to, detect, to be a detective searching for clues to reconstruct of past lives. The hardest part of that, uh, being a detective, is that the, the, the not everything preserves in the ground if it's a couple hundred years old or a few thousand years old or whatever, that things deteriorate and, and aren't, can't be found. The other thing is that we can't go back in time and see how somebody used that object. We have to try to make some sort of educated guess of how an object may have been used during its life cycle within a, a culture. So something, a broken spoon in the ground, we can all think, oh, that was used to eat with. But if we take two spoons, put them back to back, that turns into a musical instrument if you bang them on your knee. So I think the reality is you have to think a little bit outside the box. Or in this case, when you talk about enslaved African-Americans, resourcefulness that they have to live with underneath the oppression of slavery, of trying to survive and find ways to, uh, to live. And so a spoon always isn't just a spoon. And the same thing, we'll talk about that in, in some examples here in a second. But, you know, people who actually, who are archaeologists who study the, the historic past or recent past, uh, when we have written records, are called historical archaeologists. Uh, those who studied prior to uh, Blunt Mansion and, and such and, and written records in the United States, that's called prehistoric past. But um, we mostly try to look at the, the trash, compare and, and tra contrast the trash, the old trash that we discover with oral histories and other historic documents, the diaries, photographs, maps, census records, deed records, to try to combine those to look for, to tell a more complete story because neither one is accurate by themselves. No, no, one's, no one's single diary is gonna tell the lies of everybody and no single map or no single artifacts is gonna tell you, tell you the complete story. So I think the, the amazing thing is that the lives of enslaved African-Americans that lived like a place like Blunt Mansion were typically silent in their written record, that they weren't allowed to tell their own story, weren't allowed to write their own history, um, you know, be it through local laws and not being able to be taught how to read or write, let alone um, uh, the position. So the trash they left behind might be the one place where we can piece together the lives and tell their story as well, or two, beyond the Blunt family. So what areas of, of life uh, of enslaved can we look at from archeology? span Again, and uh, Michael pointed out that archeology span really is an interesting discipline um, to study because it really can, can combine everything, every discipline and previous teacher workshops that I've worked on, we've had everything from art teachers to history teachers, science, uh, music, uh, that every English, you name it, Every discipline can be applied to the field of archaeology. Uh, it's not just history. So a lot of STEM training aspects of your measuring and mapping, as well as uh, you know trying to look at art motifs and styles and culture, uh, we can go down a long list. Um, but some of the things that you know I think that we can look at highlight uh, enslaved African American life from archaeology, really the material culture, looking at everything from how what kind of what their houses look like, how big were they. Uh, the types of dishes or things they use, clothing, adornment, toys, because obviously slaves weren't just adults, there were children as well. Uh, food ways, looking at what kind of food they ate, you know, the quality of your life, or, you, know, you are what you eat. Uh, so let's look at what kind of things they ate, be it what was rationed or given to them uh, to buy this, the, by the blunts or other families, or being self-reliant provisions and actually having your own garden or finding other ways of resourcefulness to actually be able to eat. Then, of course, dealing with status and racism and race itself that, you know, that binds uh, the African-Americans uh, working at Blunt Mansion, trying to look at that quantity and quality of the food rations. You know, how good was that food? Yeah, they, they may have had pork, but what part of the, the, the pig did they eat or were they able to get? Uh, placement of structures and the use of the space. So the space organization, even that small backyard that we think of today, Blunt Mansion, uh, that there is a social structure and infrastructure, uh, you know, unconscious in many respects of how the white family and the African-Americans that lived and worked there interacted by based on how that space is used in the buildings themselves. Uh, we can talk about that through archaeology. Gender roles, obviously, looking at the history of uh, the roles, particularly of women, enslaved women on places like Blunt Mansion, we can still see that legacy of their lives as enslaved peoples going up all the way into the early 20th century. If you look at census records that they continue to be domestic servants, laundresses, seamstress, we see that as a very common role. And we find that archaeologically as evidence of those labor roles that they had on these places. But we also can look at that even the, despite the, you know, the oppression of slavery and being enslaved, that African-Americans still were able to express their own identity, their own ethnicity, their own sense of self uh, through different traditions. Some of those that can be traced back to Africa, 
uh, that we potentially can find at Blunt Mansion, let alone looking at other traditions, which I think the best way to reach anyone is through their stomach. And I love you guys, how you use food all the time, but soul food and the ideas of food is something you can also incorporate with enslaved contributions and African-American contributions to Blunt Mansion that I would add that can be expanded to future programs or adornment, how a different adornment is used. So uh, it's all fun. So when you go to Blunt Mansion today, you're standing on a beautiful streetscape and you see that house, you know, you think of William Blunt and the family and the territorial government and the signing constitution. But really most of the living and activity took place at this house were in the backyard. Uh, and where things took place on day, everything from washing, cooking, um, you know, gardening, you know, butchering a pig, uh, all took place in the backyard, not this front yard. So this is a little bit different than what you would expect. So what's in the backyard uh, today? Uh, obviously, you have a beautiful garden, uh, the Garden Club, which uh, they don't like us archaeologists because we tear up their flowers, by the way. But uh, that's a whole other story. Uh, well, you we do have in the backyard, of course. One of the main things is a, a detached kitchen that is sitting behind the house that's been reconstructed uh, a number of years ago. But it's based upon the idea, and this is where you can see that spatial division, uh, summer kitchen or detached kitchen um, it has a functional role of keeping the heat during the summer months from the main house. Uh, there is also a winter kitchen in the basement that could have been used in the winter months to retain that heat. But that idea of having that, why wouldn't you connect that building? Why is there a gap? Or why uh, is the winter kitchen in the basement Again, the enslaved African Americans, there, there's a social spatial segregation that potentially can be implied by separating of space and living space and working space of access. So you're, the African Americans are part of the, the household, but not part of the household. They're part of the everyday activities, but they're not part of activity. So it's sort of that, 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 that relationship can be just talked about by looking at the space of the buildings and how they oriented. Um, so, when we did archaeology in the backyard, and again, archaeology took place in the starting in the late 80s, really, but most of the real research of looking at enslaved African American life took start taking place in the early 90s through uh, 1996 was the, actually the last excavation year uh, that we at UT did work out there. Most of the major work focused on the southwest corner of the backyard, which this area here is where one of the slave houses stood. And, and trying to record what, what it was made from, how big it was, as well as what kind of artifacts or old trash might be found below it. Um, here's just an example of, of one of the units, excavation units. These are sort of like windows into the ground. They're about three foot by three foot squares. Just imagine taking a big piece of graph paper across the backyard and you're digging out one of those little pieces of squares in the graph paper. Uh, we did a lot of things with teachers in the classroom. We actually would tape things. You know, a lot of people's classrooms have tile on the floor. They're perfectly square. They're perfect to sort of lay out an excavation grid on your floor in your classroom and lay out artifacts or spatial distribution to understand how things are found, be it a cooking area versus a sleeping area or whatever. But you can see one of the inter interesting things in the backyard of Blunt Mansion is that the the, there's a lot of fill, uh, that the backyard is not as level as it was. Uh, it's a lot more level than it was historically. There was much more big slope back there. And they actually brought in two to three foot of fill in some of these areas historically, uh, even in, in the historic preservation as aspects sort of leveled it off. So there's actually a buried, which is nice archeologically because it buries all that old trash that was underneath that, that slave house. And so it wasn't disturbed and by the guarding activity as much because it was actually sealed. So it actually made it nice for archeologists. So you can see these are all college students. So this is actually science taking place. And this is where new scientists are being trained. And when we've done teacher workshops with excavations in the past, teachers would, all, would pair up with the college students to actually learn from them. At the same time, the college students would actually be learning from the teachers. How can we apply this into a, a regular curriculum? And the, the whole idea is not to add a whole nother subject in your classroom. Like, how do I squeeze archaeology a whole nother? I got to do math. And that's not the goal. The goal is trying to use examples from local history or maybe from archaeology in math, in art, that meets the standards that you need to test and so forth in the state. But you don't have to add something new and just trying to use some different examples or different ways of, of, of teaching it. So obviously, the mapping and graphing is, is something we do a lot of in archaeology. Um, and, 
But this is a view of the, if you go back there today, you still see that old brick sidewalk that's, that's you can walk around, but right below that sidewalk, right here, there's part of that, the, the, the foundation uh, for that old slave house that sat back there. Um, and let's see. So when you get the whole thing uh, uncovered, this is the looking on the left side of this is actually the west side. So this is where the hearth was, the fireplace. And we believe the, it was a gable entrance. So on the end where the doorway was, uh, but because of that drastic slope on the backyard that the downslope side had a much more substantial foundation than the upslope side. And because of that, uh, there was actually a crawl space underneath the building. So they used that to throw their trash. So they wound up being like a big trash midden underneath of everything from broken dishes to food remains. Uh, Charlie Faulkner's wife, Terry Faulkner is an artist and she did an artist rendering of what maybe what Blunt Mansion's backyard will look like when he lived there initially, uh, potentially anyway. So you can see the office in the corner. You can see that slave house here, an outhouse the detached kitchen and the main house here. And you can see that doorway into that basement for servants to go into do, to work and potentially do use that lower space as a, a winter kitchen or other activities down there. And this right here is a root cellar for storing of food. But you can see this central part, this sort of a, this uh, courtyard back there, you wouldn't have a nice mowed grass at all. You can, there would have been cows and gardens and one of the first things you would notice if you went back in time of walking the streets of Knoxville or any place in the United States in the 18th, 19th century would be the smells. You would definitely smell wood fires, you would smell animals, you would smell totally different uh, things than you would do today. So again, looking at gender roles, you can look at the African-American women, particularly in places like Blunt Mansion, working in urban settings of, of servants and domestic laborers and finding of push pins and, and thimbles and how that can talk about those gender roles in the household by finding something as simple as that. The material culture can lead us to those kind of discussions. Uh, the ceramics, the broken pottery is very interesting. Uh, places, people like the Blunts were very wealthy and obviously a higher status being territorial governor. But some of that wealth does flow down into the, the slaves economy of what they have access to, hand-me-downs uh, and so forth. So one of the interesting things that we did find, this is a list of ceramics. And if any of you are, are, are collectors of antiques, we'll notice that there's actually some really high end expensive Chinese export porcelain from the 18th century found in this little tiny slave house in the backyard that was broken underneath there. I mean, this is the most expensive stuff you can get and the slaves are using some of this. Just because, so that goes to show you, it's not just, you know, just because you use a piece of very expensive ceramic doesn't mean you're rich. That you have to look at the context by which something is found in relationship to where it's found to other things to really talk about the complexities of the lives that, that uh, wove on these kind of places like Blunt Mansion. Um, but my favorite thing to talk about is food because I like food, but um, everyone likes food, right? I think one of the most interesting things and most fascinating things found from the slave excavations at Blunt Mansion is the types of food that were eaten by the slaves versus what we believe that the Blunts were eating. There's two different excavation areas, one below the slave house where we, we have food remains. And there was also a midden area that was closer to the Blunt house that we believe was primarily uh, what the Blunts were eating of trash from their house. Um, looking at particularly the slave house itself, we can see pigs are number one, which is not a big surprise. It's still the pig, almighty pig is still pretty much a king in the South, in the Southeast. Um, so, but we'll talk about the importance of not just eating pigs um, um, as a Southern thing, but what cuts of meat I think is important. And so the booking of the butchered cuts of meat, and that means the ones that have the most edible meat ones that have the most nutrition, the, not as much fat, uh, but more overall uh, quality um, as far as the bones that are left behind. So again, we're studying the bones, not the meat, but looking at cranium, you know, hog jowl and the teeth area, you can see that uh, the teeth and the cranium are pretty high up uh, and the foot itself of hog's feet pig's feet. And some of those things you have to remember, again, these are, you might think these were for butter, part of the all fall or the things that are, are usually thrown away or not eaten. And, and historically, that these may be the only things that the slaves were handed down to them to eat, that the blunts would get the better cuts of the meat, and then the slaves would get the secondary cuts. And so they're actually being resourceful and trying to use those kind of things um, to make uh, new dishes that we might can connect to 
historic traditions, uh, dishes today we might consider part of soul food. So obviously chickens are also a big part of uh, food ways, but we also want to point out that besides chickens and chicken-like birds, which are probably our chickens, they're just too fragmented to tell, but bob white or quail was also present or mallard ducks, uh, teal ducks, uh, Canadian geese. So there are, aren't just uh, domestic. You think of downtown Knoxville, uh, you think they're only eating, you know, you know, domestic foods, but they aren't. And that leads us to the next one, I think is the most intriguing part of this is the amount of fish that were eaten by the slaves compared to the Blunt family household. And we have over, over almost 700 pieces of fish bone uh, that were collected. Um, the work at that time was only able to identify a small number to specific species, but compared to the Blunt Midden area, there was only, there was less than 10, less than 10 fish bones from the Blunt household and almost 700 from the, from the slaves. This tells me that the slaves were, were supplementing their diet and going down the Tennessee River and doing some fishing in the free time to try to get more food. And so what are they eating? You can see freshwater drum, which anybody's fish in, in any river, the drums are, are actually easier fish to catch. Cannel ch catfish, no surprise, but gar. Uh, anybody ever catch this sort of prehistoric looking creature, the gar right here, all these teeth uh, is very interesting and in, in looking at traditions of different uh, fish. So fish fries and fish uh, is not uncommon. And I've seen that tradition on other African-American sites that we've excavated, uh, not only in slavery, but continuing the tradition of, of uh, fishing and having fish fries as part of their diet. So overall, I think it's very interesting then looking at the slave uh, wild versus domesticated animals uh, versus the mid and the blunt foodways, you can see that the proportion that the, the darker shaded bar is wild animals, that they're nearly 70% of the bones coming from the slave house were, were things that they actually are catching on their own, fishing or whatever, versus the blunt household, the percentage is less than 10% is wild game and wild resources. So that's a huge difference. And that shows you that complexity of that food can be used as an idea, not just looking at difference in quality of life, but also how food is part, caught in that struggle between the relationship of slave and master and the status and structure and racism itself, no different than we can look at the, the buildings. So, I mean, that's, I think, one of the most interesting stories to talk about. And I think that leads into, and I would love to see expanding upon the three sisters and talking about the soul food and how food waste could also be cooked uh, of collard greens and chicken and fish and cornbread and how some of those things combining uh, different ethnic traditions of both Native American and African influences of, of dishes being created that we might still see today would be my suggestion for future research. Other ethnic traditions have also been found at Blunt Mansion related to African life. One is the use of adornment and beads and glass trade beads uh, found in the slave house context. And of course, beads could be meaning a lots of things and jewelry can mean a lot of things to different people. But one of the interesting things that we have found archeologically in the Southeast that, that the uh, glass trade beads, particularly blue beads found in slave context in the Southeast that is, that is a preferred color uh, based upon stats that there's not just a chance that this is their blue is the most common, but there's a selection process and there's association with that going back to folk beliefs that go back to West Africa and go to the ideas of the afterlife. And there's a whole, be everything from, you know, lucky charm kind of aspects to more protective spirits and things like that that get into the religious side. So there's, you can expand even beyond food and, and status and gender. You can even get into the ideas of, of ethnic origins going all the way back to Africa and how these people may have influenced and, and really on the frontier, the Tennessee frontier of, of the Native Americans, uh, America, uh, you know, white Americans uh, and African Americans and their cultures coming together right there at Blunt Mansion too. We can see it all in that detached kitchen and cooking on that hearth every night if we wanted to. So that's what I have to say, but I hope you enjoyed that. But archeology span is a fun thing to do and, and it's, uh, it's not all about, you know, finding treasure in some far off land. It's right here in our own backyard and in Blunt Mansion's case, literally in its own backyard. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tim.
Uh, folks, we are recording this. I know we're getting close to eight o'clock. So if you need to leave uh, to go to prior commitments, we completely understand. I'll be sending a link to this recording. So uh, you'll be able to see what you missed if you have to leave at eight. But I hope you can stay because now we're gonna to toss it to Lisa Oakley from East Tennessee Historical Society. At the same time that, that Tim and the other archeologists were digging in the backyard at Blunt Mansion, Lisa was digging in the archives and producing original research that really wrote the story on who the individuals were that left some of those remains in our backyard. So Lisa, you can share your screen if you like and, and tell us sure. what you found. Well, let me just say a few words um, before I show the screen. I'm gonna focus in on um, kind of my first step at discovering uh, what I know Michael's called the Rosetta Stone um, before kind of a key reference point in the document search. One of the things I wanna stress ahead of time though is how important the archeology span is to public history, to the interpretation of at historic homes, interpretation in museums, um, so much is rooted in archaeology, and we just appreciate so much the work that Dr. Faulkner and Dr. Bauman and, you know, all the other team members have done. There is an incredible record in Knoxville in the archaeology that has been done, and a lot of those reports you can search for and find um, in the library's database at, at UT Library, but I come at it from the historian's point of view when I was um, in graduate school at MTSU back in 1989 through 1991, I just enjoyed and was fascinated by learning about the African-American slave community. And I didn't realize it at the time, but it was a fairly new area of focus in the historical um, work of, of historians, probably since the 70s and, and early 80s. There were some key historians that were writing some really interesting books that I was in learning from and being inspired by. And I had an incredible professor at UT, um, Cynthia Fleming, who also just created a great interest in me in learning more about African-American history and particularly in the slave community. And so that's where I come into um, being inspired and interested in learning more about this story. So when I was um, getting ready to look at a summer internship, the folks at Blunt Mansion were interested in finding out more about what the enslaved community was like at Blunt Mansion. It fit with what my interests were in developing my thesis. And so um, I started in that summer and I will share my screen if I can get to it. And let's see, let me pull up my point. So, can you see, Michael, can you see my screen? Oh. Yes, ma'am, we can see it. Okay. <clears throat> um, so that experience that summer, I came in not having, I've, I've grown up in the area, I live in Gatlinburg. I've certainly visited Blunt Mansion. Um, an incredible staff there and board that was very supportive of seeing what could be done to find this story, to uncover the documentation of it. The excavations had not started yet. Dr. Faulkner, I've been doing some um, archaeological work, but not specifically on the slave quarters or the, you know, looking at the slave community yet. And so we started from nothing. I mean, people hadn't seen any records. There was of course, we suspected that, of course, there would have been enslaved peoples that early in the community. There had been enough general Tennessee history to be done to kind of generalize that assumption. But um, where I started is where the, the record for the slave community usually starts, and that's in the courthouse. So I went to the Knox County Courthouse, and I started with what we knew. And that all the way back into the 1920s is a record that comes from this volume in the Knox County Register of Deeds records, now in the Knox County Archives at um, the East Tennessee History Center, volume E, one pages 92 through 103 from April 1798. And there's multiple pages of this. There are all these furnishings um, all the material culture that was found when William Blunt sold his property to his half brother, um, they listed that inventory in that bill of sale um, and in that deed. And so there's a list so that now they had an idea when they were um, putting 
items into Blunt Mansion to recreate the rooms, they had this list that they could work from. This is something that was known by, by folks that had worked with Blunt Mansion for many years, but that's all they said they had ever seen. Well, pages 61 through 63, we have this document. Um, I found this just by looking up William Blunt in the index. I did this probably in the first week of my internship. Thankfully, I did it at the beginning of the internship. There's a bill of sale, um, and this is through James King to Wiley Blunt, and <coughs> King was the operative for uh, William Blunt to his half-brother, and it's a list in this bill of sale. I'm going to get a little focused in to where you might be able to see names, and we don't have to look at all of those right now, but I re quickly realized that this was a document that would help me to get a foundation of understanding who were some of the people that perhaps were at Blunt Mansion at the compound in downtown Knoxville. I had no other records at this point. This was where I started. And this was, um, this was a really powerful experience, probably a lot like Dr. Bauman and other archaeologists feel when they find that key artifact um, or something they've been looking for. And so this became the reference point, did a lot of other research in letters and in diaries and in will inventories, other bills of sale. And this became the document that I could refer back and forth to, to try to begin to discover who were the individuals at Blunt Mansion? Who can we infer? It was a lot of inference because there was no record. Um, there was no oral history that had been captured. At that time, there wasn't really the archeological work yet, but um, there are some prominent names that when you come to Blunt Mansion or when you look online for the enslaved um, peoples to be documented as they've done at Blunt Mansion. And thank you all for all the work that you've done with the research to build it out. You can see Jack's name there, um, just kind of right in the middle of the document, Jack, and then in parentheses, Hagar's son, uh, Will, Cupid. Cupid is another individual that's really important. And Dr. Bauman mentioned the family that we believe, or Josh, I guess, mentioned the family that we believe, or it can infer probably lived in or above the kitchen um, in the loft. And Cupid is the, the um, gentleman that, that we refer to there. He was also a trained builder, perhaps, you know, can infer that perhaps built Blunt Mansion or certainly instructed others to build Blunt Mansion. You go on and the men, as you notice, are listed first. And then you begin the women and Hagar shows up again um, down through there. Venus shows up and then you have Sal, which we think was Cupid's partner. Um, and Nan and Isabella are referenced as Sal's daughters because children followed the status of their mother. Um, so as you notice, all the children are referenced by their mother's name. Um, that's where their status and identity comes from. So this was kind of the beginning point. Um, and you can see just a few years later, Dr. Faulkner was able to begin the research through the archeological record. And it was just incredible to see these things come together. Um, you know, I, I didn't realize, I guess at the time that um, this would be something with such long, long lived legs. <laughs> and I'm so thankful that the work provided a good foundation. I, one of the things I have to make a disclaimer because that's been, gosh, 30 years ago now. Um, that I did that work 31 years ago. And we're working really hard. I know at Blunt Mansion, they're working really hard to um, continue the interpretation, to build it. It all needs to be um, brought up to, to date and using best practices. The historiography has grown since that time. Historians have done all kinds of new research. There's new vocabulary to use. Um, there's a point to give folks agency and humanity in their stories and to try to investigate what's been told in other places like Montpelier or Monticello um, where they've done just incredible work. So there's a lot of good work to be done and your students can help with that. You as teachers can help with that. Anyone that has an interest and wants to discover one little piece of the story for Knoxville or one little piece of the story for Tennessee, every piece that we can discover, whether it's a document, whether it's oral history, 
every piece makes a contribution and particularly to involve descendant communities, folks that have descended from um, people that have descendant uh, or have um, the enslaved ancestors story that they continue to carry forward an oral history and that sort of thing, where it's really successful is when everyone can come together and begin to share those stories using the primary sources, using the descendant stories and do all we can not to um, replace one story, but to expand, um, to expand and to really give presence and voice to all the peoples um, in Knoxville's past that made it such a rich, um, history to tell, one that's a hard history often, but to give everyone that voice that um, that they deserve their voice to be told because that's what's created the story that we have now built on. So um, this was not solitary work. It's something that I enjoyed doing, but it really depended on working with lots of archivists with Dr. Faulkner once he started his work. And now it's continuing because of the partnerships that Blunt Mansion has with all the people that have helped them and also with the teachers and students that, and, and the public that comes to learn about it and uh, make their own contributions. So thank you for your time. And um, I just wanted to kind of say a few words, but really it's so exciting to see what Dr. Bauman was able to share because that's where it really brings it to life is bringing these two things together, the historical record and primary sources, and then the material culture to talk more about how people lived. So I'll let you um, take it from there, Michael, and thank you all so much. Let's see, I'll stop my share. If I can get my, there we go. Lisa, if you will unshare, I've got one more yeah. image to share with everybody. Um, I would like to remind all of you that our website is something that's growing and changing and we're adding to it all the time. In fact, uh, just today, oh, where is this image? Let's see here. Just this morning, we did a, a documentary video interview with Lisa at East Tennessee Historical Society. She's uh, speaking in front of an, an exhibit case that contains some of the artifacts that Dr. Bowman and Dr. Faulkner and the other students unearthed at Blunt Mansion. Uh, so we're able to, to break this down into different videos. We can do one about the artifacts themselves, another about how museums work together to share stories like this, uh, another about the archaeology. So we're going to add that material as, as time goes on. We're also looking at bringing in a first-person interpreter who can create the character of uh, Sal, the enslaved cook at Blunt Mansion, and tell that story in first person. And we'll be adding that all the time. So please keep coming to bluntmansion.org and click on educational resources as we add more things. And I noticed that just in the last few minutes, somebody else has already signed up. We do have a few slots left for virtual field trips this semester. I think there are five or six left if you're interested in doing that. It's free of charge. The sign up genius indicates that they're gonna be on Thursday morning, but if you can't do it on a Thursday, we can do it another time, just let us know. And uh, other than that, uh, please do check the chat for the link to the uh, survey for tonight. Let us know what you thought, what we did right tonight, what we could do differently, and most importantly, what you need from us going forward so that we can help you to teach uh, during the pandemic and when life hopefully returns to normal in the near future. We really appreciate you being with us tonight and helping us to share Blunt Mansion story across Tennessee. Uh, Dave, do you want to share anything else before we call it a night? Well, you pretty much just said what I was going to say. So um, no, just uh, just like to thank Dr. Dr. Bowman, Dr. Uh, I'm sorry, it's been a long day. I like to thank everybody who presented tonight, all of the teachers who have joined us from all over Tennessee. And like Michael said, just let us know what we can do for you. We try to be as responsive as possible and we love ideas and especially, you know, uh, feedback coming directly from teachers is one of the ways that we create some of the best content. So let us know what we can do for you and we'll be happy to give it a shot. And uh, I know people are gonna be asking me this question in an email shortly because I've already heard a few today. We'll be uh, going through all the attendance tomorrow and Josh is working on the participation certificates. Those will go out uh, in the email as a PDF early next week. And I think what's coming in the future with these is probably more virtual PDs that are focused on one topic. We kind of did a, a buffet or a smorgasbord uh, Tuesday night and tonight and crammed a lot into one hour each time. 
I think there might be some value in perhaps having a having Lisa and, and Tim put together an entire hour long program, maybe a virtual version of what they did uh, in person in 2015, or, uh, you know, an entire deep dive into how you can teach the Constitution using William Blunt as Tennessee's signer of the US Constitution and framer of the state Constitution. So we'll be uh, emailing you about those. And we hope to see you again here very soon. Does anybody else have any last questions before we uh, wrap this up? You can put them in chat or uh, Say them out loud if you have anything you'd like to add. All right. Well, have a wonderful uh, evening. Hope you have a great weekend coming up. And if you've got a spring break next week, like we do at Knoxville, I hope you enjoy it. Stay safe if you can. Have a good evening. Thanks for coming. Lisa, it's always good to see you. I don't get to see you enough. I know. Well, we do need to do something else again. I mean, it's it's so timely, I think, and so yeah. important. And there's so much, I know, in the historical side of things, the historiography, there's so much new work being done. And there's an intern, um, and I told Michael this. I don't think I told you, Dave, but Stella um, Dvorkian. Is that how you say her name? I can't think how you say her last name. But anyway um she's in pat ruttenberg's class and okay. she's helping me part-time she's at beck center part-time and then with me and she was just fascinated about the work that's been done at blunt mansion and i told told her i said well you know what we've got to do is we've got to bring that 30 year old bibliography <laughs> <laughs> up to date because i've not done anything with it and so that's what she's been working on. And, you know, I've told a lot of times I'll talk to the students when I do their introductory session and I'll say, you know, the, the key thing is this is a generational thing. You know, there's a generation of scholars that brings up another generation of scholars and those young scholars build on what they did, but they take it in new directions or they, in the case of the enslaved community, they, they look for new things. It's not just in public history saying that there were slaves here anymore. It's actually giving names and, you know, labor and agency and, and all those things. So it builds. Well, when she started doing that research and re realized that out of all those folks that wrote that seminal work, two thirds of them have passed away. Hmm. And she said, I get it now. <laughs> and so and of the ones that are left, they're all senior scholars now that are the ones that everyone else is referring to, or they're the ones that are editing the volumes. And I said, so see, now you can see that these are the folks, you can start with them and see these other folks are the, and she said, yeah, and this person studied under this person. <laughs> I said, see, that's what we need to know. Now we need to know who are these new historians and what are they saying? So we're gonna have a good bibliography out of it, I think. And that'll be really important to what we do from here. We really need to understand what the historians are saying. I think it stayed more active in the, probably in the archeological world, um, building and growing, and maybe you don't have these fits and starts um, generationally, well, I mean, but. It, it, they all have cycles, but yeah. I did send Michael and, and David, at least a more up to date of all the archeology span publications specific to Blunt Mansion, be it ones that they don't know about in the smaller right. archaeology journals or whatever else, but I tried to put together and combine everything I could find and send it to them. So I think this is, I think that's a big deal. I think that's going to make a big difference for what's done now for all of us. And so I'm excited about it. So it's good. We need to get back together. We need to, you know, like Michael said, maybe do another, you know, workshop. Yep. I, I definitely think so. And, I, and I'd like to see some, as I mentioned, I think you guys, the, the hands-on stuff you're doing with, Oh yeah. In, in the kitchen, it provides such a, a wonderful place to talk about all of this, every avenue of relationships in that kitchen, uh, you know, from just the cultural mixture of different foods to obviously the social relationships and gender roles. And I mean, you have such an opportunity that kitchen can provide the centerpiece of everything yeah. um, of that um, interaction of everyone who worked there. 
some yeah. level or live there. So absolutely. And I mean, just just in a in a very small way, whenever I do my program for like fourth graders or whatever they come through, you have a little teeny tiny fire like this big, just making some Johnny mm -hmm. cakes over it, and they walk in and they start sweating and you know, <laughs> and it's all that. And it really sort of like drives it home that this is, you know, this was rough work. You know, mm -hmm. if a fire this big can make me that hot, imagine cooking for 18 people, 30 people, you know, in the middle of August, you know, just, you know, it, it really brings it, brings it to them in a way that's uh, uh, really kind of, uh, kind of interesting. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you all so much for everything you're doing, Dave. And I don't know if Michael's still on the, he just came back. Okay. Well, we appreciate it so much and just let us know if there's any other way we can help. Well, you know, y'all make y'all make our job easier because you bring this 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 you know this level of expertise and knowledge that that you know we can basically just wind you guys up and let you go and people love it. So you know, it's, well, uh, we're tickled to see what the teachers are able to work into their classrooms and and ask for where the gaps are. So yeah. we're there to help however we can. Well, I'm gonna let y'all go. You have a great one, everybody. Stay safe. See you. Right. See ya. See you guys later. Have a good see one, guys.